Well, good morning, church family. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41 as we continue our walk through uh, the life of Joseph, this summer sermon series. We've been walking through Joseph's life. We last left him in, uh, in the pit, in the dungeon, where he will have been there for 13 years of his life. You hold your spot there. Before we jump in, I wanted us to spend a few moments knowing, uh, guys, we've got so much going on. We've got our kids going to Cairo. We just came off of vacation Bible school. Thank you for uh, stepping up and serving in magnificent ways. Uh, Church family, you've been awesome. Yeah, you've been awesome. We will do whatever it takes to reach the next generation with the hope of the gospel. You saw baptisms this morning in response to Uh, our youth living out their lives for the name of Jesus. And and we have our choir going to our nation's capital um, to sing and to speak the name of Jesus. So so I wanted to, uh, as a church, just spend a few moments praying for our choir that's going, um, as well as just uh, our nation and, and the need for revival. But real quick, I found out yesterday that there was uh, an emergency that happened. There was a small fire at uh, Bernie High School that happened to be that one of our sister churches, the bridge that meets there, uh, they're an awesome church. Jared is a friend of mine. There's there's not a better pastor in Bernie than Jared Patrick. uh, But they were unable to meet this morning due to that. So they're kind of in scramble mode a little bit and trying to figure out what that's going to look like for them. And And so just as a sister church, they're doing incredible things to reach uh, uh, families and demographics that uh, here in Bernie, uh, and and we want to pray for them as well. So let's just open our service with praying for our choir and our nation, as well as our sister church, The Bridge. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. King Jesus, in you is life is life, the good news of the gospel that saves. God, we have so much to rejoice in. This 64 children that came to faith this past week, how amazing it is that the good news of you, King Jesus, is understandable and, and can be discerned and that your spirit works in even a young child. In fact, coming to you with faith like a child is what you require of us. We praise you for that. And yet the the depth of the gospel will never be exhausted in all of eternity. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our nation to come to know you in revival, that that the good news would, would, would spread, that your spirit would sweep through us in a powerful, magnificent ways. Your word teaches us to pray for our leaders, and so we pray for our president right now. Your word teaches us to to pray for this upcoming election. And so, Father, we, we pray as a people that our hearts would be deeply burdened for our ways, for the ways that we have left you as a people for the ways that we have forsaken you and not discerned your truth and your word. Father, forgive us. We pray for our choir as they go and sing the truth of Jesus in our nation's capital. Father, that, that, you, would, that you would use that for the glory of your name. Father, we pray for our sister church, the bridge that's doing so many awesome things right here in Bernie. And Father, we pray that that during this crisis, God, that you would be with them um, and that you would be helping them, give them wisdom to solve issues and problems and move them forward. Uh, Bernie needs the bridge to be an awesome, vibrant church, and so we pray for them. Give their leadership strength and wisdom and understanding. Now, Father, as we come to this service, as we open your word, we want to hear from you. God, we long to hear from you. There is no voice like yours. There is no one that can save except for you. And so we pray this day that you would use um, our singing, that you would use the, the testimony of baptism, and that you would use your word to speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
All right, so let's, let's jump in. Let me give you a, a, a quick starter verse, right? In Genesis chapter 41, verse 1. Now, it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. At the end of two full years. <clears throat> Guys, that means that Joseph will now spend his 30th birthday in jail alone, in a dungeon, 13 years of his life incarcerated. From the age of 17 that his brother sold him into slavery and now in the dungeon, he he had hope last time that the the baker and the cupbearer, that the cupbearer would get out and would remember him two full years later. And Pharaoh has a dream. As Tom Petty once sang, the waiting is the hardest part. None of us like waiting. And put yourself in Joseph's shoes, okay? Because what questions would your heart be asking? God, did you forget me? God, have you forsaken me? Is there any point to my misery? God, are you even good? Joseph's account, like Job, forces us to look at difficult issues of unjust suffering and waiting on the Lord. Not being able to see God's plans, but still trust. I am the clay and you are the potter. I trust you, God. I trust you. Excuse me, as I wrestle with my allergies, I apologize. But the child of God comes to a certain point where he realizes, listen, no matter how dark and confusing the waiting gets, the truth is God has not forgotten and God will not forsake his own. Listen. To scripture, Isaiah 49. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget. This is God speaking. But I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. You see, God is the most faithful. He is the most devoted father. He is more loving and tender than the most affectionate mother. And when you need to remember this, remember the cross. Remember that he gave his son for you. Remember all that his son suffered and endured in order to call you his own. Believer, something incredibly important for us to settle this morning is that God has plainly stated in his word, Romans 8, 29, what his goal in your life is. You ready? God's goal in your life is to make you look like Jesus. To make you look like Jesus so that you would carry the impressions of God wherever you go. And for that not to just be lip service, but for that to be in your character, for that to be who you are. And let me go ahead and point out the pattern that is all through Scripture that people needed waiting and suffering for that to occur. Joseph was in captivity for 13 years. David ran from King Saul, hiding in caves for almost a decade. Abraham spent 25 years waiting for the promise of Isaac's birth. Moses spent 40 years as a shepherd away from Egypt before God finally called him back. And I've just scratched the surface. 
Believer, you must settle it in your heart and you must settle it right now. If you are going to look more like Christ, God is going to have to refine you like gold. And that will involve the heat of trials and difficulties, waiting and trusting when you can't see. In fact, that's the image that Peter gives in 1 Peter chapter 1. That your faith is more precious than gold. And did you know that there's a process for cleaning up gold? For making gold absolutely perfect, absolutely pristine? It must be heated up. And as it's heated up, the imperfections boil to the top. And then they are scraped off. That's the image that scripture gives you, believer, about what God is doing in your life with your faith. Because the question is, is what comes out when you are squeezed? That's the test of your faith. Not when everything's going good, but when you are squeezed. And that's where we've been in Joseph's life. Here for three weeks, but for Joseph, 13 years. Now, do you guys want some good news? You want some really good news? Because we've been walking through patiently all the suffering and all the waiting for three weeks. Do you want some good news? Once God has accomplished what he has desired in the refining process, God exalts Joseph beyond his wildest imagination. God restored and blessed Job God was faithful and did not forget Abraham and Sarah. And God lifted David to the throne and gave him promises beyond what he ever even dreamed of. In fact, that is also a pattern and a promise of Scripture. That's where Peter ends. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you have suffered for a little while, God himself will come to you and restore you. Are you suffering? Are you waiting? Are you confused about what is going on in your life? Remember that the same God who gave his son for you, here, it is promised, he will come to you. Once that trial has accomplished what he desires in your life, and praise God, can I just say that he does not treat us all like Joseph here, that so often he does this in stages, that that he doesn't do it all at once, But he himself will come to you and restore you, establish you. God actually promises blessings after suffering. So I remember teaching my children to swim. Any of you parents ever done that? It's it's, uh, pretty fun. Each child is different. Let me tell you about my middle child, Eli, okay? He was the one that clung to me the hardest, right? You you get him in the pool, and once they were, had done a few things and learned a few things, now it was time to get in the center of the pool with dad, okay? And there I stand, and he is just clinging to me as hard as he can. Now, What he wants at that moment is he would really like comfort. He would really like security. He would really like to just be out of the pool right now, Dad. (laughs) But as a father, I see my son, and I desire, I know what is best for him. He must learn to swim. It's good for him. He needs that safety skill. 
So there he is in the middle of the pool, (coughs) clinging to me with a firm grip. Hold me, Dad. Do not let me go. But because I love him, I turn him the other way, and I shove him off. Now, he can't see me anymore, can he? And he is fighting, and he is kicking, and he is panicked. Where am I? I'm right behind him. Am I going to let him fall any further than what is appropriate? Am I going to let him drown? Absolutely not. I want you to understand this, believer. It's a magnificent picture. God desires for you to look like his son. And God loves you so much that he's willing to make you fight, to make you grow, to put you through the trials of life because it's necessary. But he is there. Even if you can't see him, even if you can't feel him, he is right there. Amen? All right, so Pharaoh has a dream. Two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. Let's pick up our story in 41 verse 8. (coughs) It says, after this dream, in the morning, uh, Pharaoh, in his spirit, he was troubled So he sent and he called for the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. And Pharaoh told his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them. You see, Pharaoh is looking, I want you to notice, Pharaoh is looking for someone who knows God, who walks with God, who has the wisdom of God, who carries the impressions of God. That's who Pharaoh's looking for, but there was none. There was none. Now this situation becomes ripe for the man of God. It becomes ripe for someone that God has set apart and that God is is ready to lift up and exalt. Now as Pharaoh searched, could not find an interpreter for his dream, naturally the cupbearer who's there, he's a little anxious. He sheepishly is like, listen, Pharaoh, I don't want to remind you of this. It's been two years, but it's important. You remember when you were furious with me so much that you almost killed me? You threw me in prison. You ended up killing the the baker. Uh, While I was in prison, there there was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. There was a Hebrew, someone from who's not like us. He could interpret dreams. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh, right? After being in a dungeon for as many years as he has, that's a good idea, all right? Shave, shower, change your clothes. Now put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Do you think he's nervous I mean, he's been, he's been in the dungeon maybe five years. Do you think he's nervous? He's now standing before Pharaoh, the most powerful man in, in the entire world. Also ask this, do you think he's resentful of that cupbearer who forgot him for two more years in the dungeon? He's going to be standing right there. Do you think Joseph is is working up a speech in order to get himself out? Do you think at this point his character is going to show, listen, forget God. I am tired of waiting. This is my chance. I'm going to get myself out of here. Verse 15 through 16, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard that it's been said about you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. You hear that? 
It is not in me. Joseph is not hastily correcting Pharaoh. Again, the most powerful man on the planet, Joseph is standing before. He corrects him. He doesn't do it hastily. He is humbly giving all credit and all glory where it is due. Pharaoh, God alone is the one who can interpret your dream. It is not in me. Do you see the refinement that we can see in Joseph's life? All right, when he was a teenager, it's possible to read that account and to think he had an air of pride to him. Okay? His brothers certainly took his dreams as, as him uh, uh, being on top of them, right? As he, him taunting them. But now he stands before Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who's trying to give him credit for being a dream interpreter, and Joseph corrects, it's not in me, it's God. Now, in verses 17 through 24, Pharaoh gives the dreams. It starts with seven fat cows. Seven, I mean, you want, if you're a farmer, you want a fat, glorious cow. And Pharaoh, in his dream, sees these huge, just plump cows. But those seven cows are followed by seven skinny not healthy looking, scrawny cows that come up and eat the seven healthy cows. There's the end of that dream. Well, even after eating the, the cows, uh, the seven healthy cows, the seven scrawny cows are still scrawny. That's the end of that dream. And then Pharaoh had a second dream. He sees one, uh, one giant stalk that has seven beautiful, plump heads of grain on it. He looks, oh, that's a that's good-looking crop. But then that's immediately followed by this scrawny-looking stalk uh, that's been scorched by the wind. It looks awful. And somehow, that grain eats the other grain. And then it all vanishes. It disappears. So Pharaoh tells his dream to Joseph. And in verse 32, uh, Uh, Sorry, verse 25. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. That is seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine will be so bad that they will make you forget the good years. So in verse 32. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice... It means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. You see, Joseph interprets the dream for him, but he doesn't stop there. Joseph's preaching to him, okay? And guess what? He's preaching what he knows to be true. (laughs) He's saying God is in control, Pharaoh, and God has been gracious and kind enough to give you a warning, That hard times are coming, but God has warned us in order to get us through. Now, if you're reading this, have you ever stopped and thought about how gracious and merciful God is to people that do not even know him? That he's warning them ahead of time for their good. That he sent Joseph as someone who carries the impressions of God to be their rescuer, But Joseph doesn't stop interpreting uh, with simply interpreting the dream. He has been specifically prepared for this very moment in order to give wise counsel to Pharaoh. Now, I've thought about this for a bit, so I want to ask you the question. Because we we always want to know, God, why did it take so long? So long with Joseph, 13 years in captivity, 13 years, probably five years in a dungeon. Why did it take so long? Why was there so much suffering and so much waiting? But now I want you to pause. I want you to think about this. Think about the nations 
and the hundreds of of thousands of people that are about to be affected by seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Now think about the timing in every individual's life. And God says, now is the time for that. Think about the timing in Joseph's brother's lives, who last we saw in the story, they were evil and wicked and they had sold him to slavery. Think about the timing in their life because here soon, they're going to be forced to go to Egypt for food because of the famine. Think about the timing in Joseph's life in order to develop his character and also to develop his leadership skills so that he would be ready for this moment as a leader, so that, so that he could represent God as God wants him to. And Joseph is prepared to give Pharaoh wise counsel because Joseph knows that the nature of man in those seven years of plenty is to be wasteful. So pick up in verse 33. This is Joseph speaking. After interpreting the dream, he also says, Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him extract a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for the food in the cities in a reserve, uh, sorry, under Pharaoh's authority, and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land, for the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land will not perish during the famine. So when Joseph's time comes to stand before Pharaoh, he gives honest, wise, and discerning counsel. All of these characteristics... All right, he has acquired through God's school of hard knocks. And here's the magnificent piece. When you read this, he wasn't bargaining for his own future. He wasn't trying to create a position for himself. At no point does he mention himself or his situation. He's not self-promoting. He's not even trying to manipulate the moment with hints of himself. There he stands, silently, waiting for God to exalt him. Do you know the perils of self-exaltation? When you push others down so that you can rise up? You're always afraid that it's gonna fall down like a house of cards that you're juggling everything, but in an instant, it can all come crashing down. But here's the deal. When God exalts, there's a peace and a rest, a security, knowing you are standing on his shoulders. It's his burden, whether you rise or fall. And he has already promised to sustain you In that moment, it is completely freeing. The complete opposite of self-exaltation. When God exalts you, it's completely freeing. Because you know it's him. And what has now become apparent in our text is that God has taken 13 years in order to prepare Joseph for this very task, and God is ready to exalt him. So in verse 37, now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. And then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? I want you to see again what the lost world is looking for. Someone who carries the impressions of God. And they've looked, and they can't find any. Picture the scene. Because it said, after uh, 
after Joseph made the proposal, everyone in the room was like, that's a brilliant idea. Where are we going to find a guy like that who has a divine spirit, who carries the impressions of God? And they look around, and it's crickets. And it's crickets. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Talk about the most unlikely candidate. Hours before, he was in a dungeon. A dungeon of filth. But we're told through the story, everywhere he went, he carried the impressions of God. Into Potiphar's house, even into the dungeon, and now as he stood before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh could see what the Lord had done in his character. Pharaoh could see it. He didn't know what it exactly was, but he could see it. And he puts him over it all. Here's the biblical principle you must understand. God loves to exalt the humble, but opposes the proud. That God promises to exalt the humble. Now, what you must understand about humble is it doesn't mean you're like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. You just walk around, you're like, oh, woe is me. Nothing good's ever going to happen to me. That's not what it means to be humble. What it means to be humble, you have to have a, a correct understanding of who God is and who you are. Okay? You've been made in God's image, okay? but you are not God. You are completely dependent upon him. You have to understand, I needed a savior. He came and he saved me. I need his spirit inside of me in order to give me wisdom. I need him to lead me and to guide me, all of those things. That's what it means to be humble. Listen to these verses. Proverbs 18, 12, before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. 22, verse 4 of Proverbs, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Catch this, Isaiah 66, verse 2, but to this one I will look. God is looking for this person, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Do you want God to look upon you with special interest and with special favor? Be humble. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Do you need grace? Do you need extra grace? Be humble. God loves to exalt the humble, and he opposes the proud. Now, what has Joseph learned in these 13 years that we can see that makes him humble? Well, one, we would say he works hard, and he's seen God bless him through his work. In other words, he is not entitled. Entitlement is pride. He's also learned that his giftings come from God. Not only his gifting to interpret dreams, but also his giftings to be a manager. And he repeatedly expresses that. Hey, listen, that comes from God. I give all credit to God. Throughout the entire narrative, we heard him pointing to God. He's shown that he will not compromise against Potiphar or God, even to get himself out of prison. He won't compromise. And he puts others first. He finds a ministry even in the dungeon. And in the end, we see that he has become a vessel that God delights to use. 
God delights to use him. Another word or a picture for being humble is meek. Scripture has the repeated promise that the meek will inherit the earth. When you think of meekness, think of a horse after it's become broken. It's still a strong and beautiful and magnificent, has all the strength, but it will go wherever the master leads. So I ask you, does that image reflect, reflect your life at home, at work, at school, in your community? Are you meek? Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. And he had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he had set him over all the land of Egypt. See, Joseph's brothers stripped him of his coat of many colors. They took that off of him. And Potiphar's wife had to strip that tunic off of him in order for God to now clothe Joseph with his plans. What does God need to strip off of you in order to clothe you with his plans? But the great thing as you walk through this, as you study, as you pay attention, right? All of Joseph's waiting, all of his suffering, it wasn't the end. It was only the beginning. It was the beginning for all that God wanted to do. I bet if you had asked Joseph the whole time, Joseph, what do you want God to do? He would say, I just want to get out of here. I'm just looking to get out. And now look at where God has placed him. See, God's plans are greater than what you could ever imagine. And he has promised. So listen, let me say this to us right now, and then we'll close. What are you going through right now where it feels like you are waiting? Where it feels like God is, is, is making character reformation? You are being refined as gold. Listen, I can't promise you the second in all the land of Egypt. But you know what I can promise you? That when God has finished accomplishing his purposes, God will restore you. That on the other side, God loves to exalt the humble. And he loves to bless his children with good gifts. He loves to do that. And that is his promise to you this morning. The question is, is do you believe him? And do you trust him? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, you have amazing promises and amazing truth for your children. Even as we study Joseph's life, as, as we think about all that you have done, incredibly difficult. There's not a person in this room, I think, that would, that would exchange what Joseph has gone through. And yet, Father, we can learn incredible lessons of life and truth about what you are doing in us that your deep desire to transform our character, to make us like your son, is what you are up to. And we as your children, we pause to say, all right, God, I trust you. You're my father, I trust you. And I believe that you have amazing blessing on the other side, that you love to exalt the humble, that you're gonna use it for good. I believe that as we read about it in Joseph's life. God, I trust you in my own circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, it's an opportunity for you to do exactly what we just prayed, that is to do business with the Lord, to surrender. I'm certain in this room, there are a number of you going through circumstances that you do not understand 
and you need to just surrender. You, you, you need to bow the knee in your heart and say, all right, God, I trust you. We have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Um, as we stand and sing, I pray that you would sing in faith.